Today on Know the Truth, Philip DeCourcy shares an important reminder. The day of the Lord is a time marked by God's righteous judgment of the unrighteous. It's a time when justice will be served. It's a time when the Christ-rejecting world will come face to face with our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. And the prayer of the Lord's Prayer will be finally answered. Your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. thought about the return of Christ lately? Does Jesus' second coming impact your daily decisions and long-term plans? As Christians, we look both to the past and the future as we seek to please God with our lives. So today on Know the Truth, Philip DeCourcy describes a church that was a shining example of living with a strong sense of history and hope. We're continuing our verse-by-verse study of 1 Thessalonians 1 with a message called The Real Deal. Here's our teacher, Philip DeCourcy. In his best-selling book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey identifies one of the seven habits as, begin with the end in mind. Stephen Covey wants us to know that highly effective people are clear-headed. They're fixed. They're constantly working at keeping the goal in view. They begin with the end in mind because that keeps them off the side streets of distraction. That keeps them from being satisfied with secondary successes. Effective people, whether in the medical field or on the athletic field, work hard at keeping the main thing the plain thing. You know, I was thinking about this this week. We haven't talked about the Ohio State University for a while, and so I thought I'd come back to that. You know the great rivalry between Ohio State and Michigan. And there is a saying around the Woody Hayes Athletic Center in Columbus, Ohio, what did we do today to beat Michigan? That is said on every day of the week, every week of the year. In fact, when Jim Trestle was the coach of Ohio State, you could stop him on any given day of the season and ask him how many days it was till they played Michigan, and he would rattle the number off. He was a highly effective coach, at least for a while, that's for sure. And he kept the goal in mind. He kept the end in view. That's what highly effective people do. They begin with the end. But that's not only true of highly effective people, it is also true of deeply spiritual people. Deeply spiritual people. You see, the follower of the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament was a person who lived their life with the end in mind. If you go to 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7, you'll get an example of this. Peter writes to the believers who are scattered. And he says this, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. He says, here's what you ought to be doing, given the fact that the end of all things is at hand. They went about their business with an eye to the sky. What I mean by that is that they lived, loved, and labored under the overhanging prospect of Jesus' imminent return to carry them off to heaven. We read in Titus 2 verse 13 that the early church was looking for that blessed hope of the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. In Jude verse 21, Jude writes to the believers of the early church and says this, keep yourselves in the love of God, pray in the Holy Spirit, and look for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is another way of speaking about the second coming. They started their day thinking about the end of time. They closed their day thinking about the last chapters of human history. 
The second coming was not an occasional thought to them, nor was it a distant prospect. It was a doctrine. It was a prospect. It was a truth that infused their life on every level with meaning and momentum. That's why the watchword of the early church was what? Maranatha. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 22. Come, Lord Jesus. They lived on the tiptoe of expectancy. And here's the striking thing as we come back into 1 Thessalonians. This love for Christ's appearing was engendered in them from the moment they put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The last things were never last in the early church. In fact, this letter we're studying mentions the second coming in every chapter. We're told as soon as these people came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they set up waiting for Jesus' return. Paul tells us here, they turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven. 26% of this letter is given over to the subject of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you combine First and Second Thessalonians, almost a third of the material contained in both those letters combined is prophetic in nature. A survey of Paul's writings, and here's a classic example, shows that he had a major interest in the last days. And he shared that, and he passed on that passion to Christian converts as soon as as they put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, without exception, Paul in his letters speaks about the second coming. In fact, I take that back. There is an exception. It's the letter to Philemon. Other than that, Paul addresses the second coming in all his New Testament literature. In fact, you'll find major sections of those books have eschatological themes. Romans 11, he speaks about the future of Israel. 1 Corinthians 15, he speaks about the prospect of our resurrection and cheating death if Jesus was to come in our lifetime. In 1 Thessalonians 4, he talks about the snatching away of the church, commonly known as the rapture. In 1 Thessalonians 5, he talks about the day of the Lord and the coming of God's judgment and wrath upon an unbelieving world. In 2 Thessalonians 1, he talks about the visible and glorious return of the Lord Jesus Christ with His saints to earth to destroy the Antichrist and indeed to vindicate His own glory before a watching world. My friends, for Paul, it's not enough to be a pro-millennialist or a pan-millennialist. He's looking for something more. He's looking for a definitive and a keen interest on our part as it comes to the second coming. In fact, Paul believed that it was his job, along with any true minister of the gospel, to make a people ready and prepared for the second advent. He, in some ways, we might put it like this, saw his ministry in relation to the second coming as we saw John the Baptist's ministry in relation to the first coming. In Luke chapter 1, verse 17 of John the Baptist, it is said that he made a people ready and prepared for the coming of the Lord, the first coming. And Paul did that as an apostle in relation to the second coming. So, as we come back into the context of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, I want to pick up this thought that this was an expectant church. And as we started to unfold that idea and look at that truth, we started to look at the prospect of Jesus coming and its anticipation, its articulation, and its application When we were together last in this letter, we were looking at Paul's articulation of the doctrine of the second coming. When we come to chapter 1 here in verse 10, and Paul tells us that this was a body of believers who were waiting up for Jesus' soon return. This is the first mention of the doctrine of the second coming in this letter, but it won't be the last mention. In fact, as we've said, Paul mentions this doctrine in every single chapter in this book. What we have here in verse 10 of 1 Thessalonians 1 is Paul threading a needle, introducing the idea of Jesus' second advent. 
And what he will do from this moment forward is he will take that needle and that thread of truth, and he will weave it throughout this letter. And that's what I want to do for a few moments. I want to take a look at Paul's big picture as it relates to the second coming. He encourages them to wait up for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But in this letter, he does more than that. He articulates some of the major events and personalities that will surround the last days and bump up against the coming of Jesus for His church and with His church. Now, the last time we were together, we noted two, and I'm not going to rehash it or rehearse it, just to put you in remembrance. Number one, the first thing that Paul addresses in his writing to the Thessalonians is the imminent return of Christ to snatch away His church to heaven. He teaches that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. This is when we'll be caught up to the air to meet the Lord, and then Christ will take us to the Father's house, John 14, verses 1 through 6. This is commonly known as the rapture. Every Christian believes in the rapture. There is a discussion as to the timing of the rapture, but every Christian believes in the rapture. And Paul brings that before this church. He says in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1, there will come a time when we will be gathered unto Him. The believing will be leaving. And it's my conviction that that will take place prior to the onset of the tribulation. We touched on that the last time, and we'll hold our powder until we get the 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, and I hope I'll be able to show that much more definitively. The second thing that Paul addresses is the resurrection of the believing dead. This is associated with the rapture when there will be a resurrection from out among the dead, not a general resurrection. When Jesus comes to call His church to heaven, the believing saints of God who have put their faith in Jesus Christ during the church age, they will be caught up. Those who are asleep will precede us. If we're alive and remain when Jesus comes back, we will come after them. The dead will be raised. The living will be translated. If you go to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 51, you'll realize that this was a new truth. If you go back to the Old Testament, the idea of a resurrection is there. Job holds out that hope, doesn't he, of standing in his own resurrected body on the earth looking at his Redeemer. But what wasn't taught in the Old Testament was a resurrection out from among the dead. That's why Paul will call the rapture and the resurrection associated with it a mystery. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, he says, I'm going to tell you a mystery, something hidden beforehand, but now revealed. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. And so Paul articulates these two ideas. First, he addresses the imminent return of Christ to snatch away his church to heaven. And secondly, he addresses the resurrection of the believing dead at the rapture. Now, if you're taking notes, here's his third issue. As we just take a view of this letter and the subsequent letter, 2 Thessalonians, we'll see that Paul thirdly addresses the coming day of the Lord. He talks about a time at the end of history that the Bible designates as the day of the Lord. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 1. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord... So comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in the darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. He'll pick this theme up in chapter 2 of the second letter. In chapter 2 and verse 1, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as from us, as though the day of Christ or the day of the Lord, it could be translated also, had come. Paul brings before us the prospect of a time designated as the day of the Lord. This is a phrase you'll find back in the Old Testament also. It's used by the prophets. Sometimes it speaks of near judgment, but often it speaks of prophetic and distant judgment that awaits an unbelieving world at the end of time. The day of the Lord is an extended period of time. It begins with the tribulation. It concludes 
with the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the establishment of His thousand-year reign on the earth. And so there's a mix of judgment and blessing within the time we call the day of the Lord. The tribulation then is the storm before the calm of the millennial kingdom. It's the birth pangs of a new age, according to 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 3. And what you'll see in the study of the Old Testament and the New Testament, we'll fill this out as we get to these passages. The day of the Lord is a time marked by God's righteous judgment of the unrighteous. It's a time when justice will be served. It's a time when the wicked will be damned. It's a time when the Christ-rejecting world will come face to face with our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. It's a time when Christ will be vindicated before man. It's a time when heaven will impose its rule on earth. And the prayer of the Lord's Prayer will be finally answered in all its potential fullness. Your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. This is a time of judgment. If you go back to Joel 2 and verse 30 and 31, we're brought to envision this day. Joel, looking forward, says, I will show you wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke, and the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. The Lord Jesus picks that theme up when he describes what happens at the end of the great tribulation after the abomination of desolation, after the appearance of the man of sin who calls the world to worship him in the place of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we get to Matthew 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and glory. And he will send his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. It's a time of justice. It's a time of judgment. And Paul sets it out before the Thessalonians, and we'll come to it more fully. But before we leave it, I want to say this. It's a time of judgment directed towards the world. It's a time of discipline and punishment directed towards Israel. If you want to look those ideas up, then go to Jeremiah 30, verse 7, where Jeremiah tells us that the great tribulation is Jacob's trouble. After the removal of the church, God will pick up his prophetic plan with Israel, and he will purge Israel, judge Israel, discipline Israel during the great tribulation. Antichrist will war against Israel after he's broken covenant with them at the midway point of the tribulation. We read in Revelation 6, verse 16 and 17, that the world will hide from the coming wrath of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb. Oh, it's a time of judgment for the world It's a time of purging and discipline for Israel, but it's a time from which the church of Jesus Christ will be exempt. I think that's important for us to see. Paul clearly teaches that, doesn't he, in his letter to the Thessalonians. Go to chapter 1 and verse 10 again. And he speaks of them having turned from idols to serve the true and the living God. And there they are waiting for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come, the wrath associated with His second coming, which will be concentrated in that seven-year period called the tribulation. We see this thought again in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, where Paul actually talks about the day of the Lord and how it's going to surprise the world. It's going to come upon them like a thief in the night. But we know it's not going to happen to us. We're not of the night. We're of the day. And then in verse 9, what does he say? For God did not appoint us to the wrath. The wrath in the context of 1 Thessalonians 5 is the day of the Lord. The Lord did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. They belong to the night. We belong to the day. And it's my belief that the church will be exempt from this time called the day of the Lord. 
In fact, I think that explains why this church is so disturbed by uh, either a false teacher or a spurious letter that was sent to them as if it came from the apostles saying that they will already in the day of the Lord. Go to Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 2. Paul says, Now don't be shaken in mind. Don't be troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ has come. He says, No, you're not in the day of the Lord. I told you that. They were not appointed to that time of tribulation and trouble. And so they're disturbed, and Paul has the right to correct their misunderstanding, which again just shows us that this is a time that God will exempt the church from. Maybe the best way to illustrate it would be, you know that before the commencement of hostilities in any war between nations, usually it's preceded by the removal of the nation's citizens or ambassadors from the country that's about to be attacked. Once those people have been evacuated, the bombs will start dropping, the cruise missiles will start landing. And I think that's a picture of what will take place on the run-up to the tribulation. God will call His ambassadors home, and then He will announce war with the world, which will lead to the battle of Armageddon and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with His saints. There's a fourth thing that Paul addresses in his articulation of the doctrine of the second coming. We're going to drill down into each of these issues when we meet them within the context. But I want you to see the big picture. Paul's saying, hey, look, here's what lies ahead. Here's what the future holds. It holds a rapture. It holds a snatching away, a catching away of believers to the air to be with the Lord forever. Alongside that, there's a resurrection out from among the dead of those who have died in the Lord Jesus Christ. The future also holds a period of time called the day of the Lord that will ultimately end in blessing. It's called the millennium. It's called the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. But before we get there, the sun will be darkened. It will be a terrible time on planet earth when God will wreak vengeance upon an unbelieving world and bring Israel to repentance through all that he puts them through. This is the time when the believing will be leaving. A message of hope for those who trust Christ. You're listening to Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. Well, there are many reasons why the church in Thessalonica was exemplary, and their focus on Christ's return is just one of them. We've been studying about this church all month in a series called Classic Christianity. You can order the complete study on CD or listen to individual messages free at ktt.org. Hopefully, through this study, we're all learning how to be prepared for Christ's return. And if you're new to Know the Truth, we have a resource to help you follow the Thessalonians' example. If it's your first time contacting us, we'll send you the Model Church Study Bookmark. It outlines many of the principles we've been studying today. Ask for the free bookmark when you call 888-644-8811. Now, it can be hard to be a good example when we feel worn and weary. So, Pastor Philip wants you to find the strength you need. That's the title of a book by author Robert J. Morgan. In his book, Rob Morgan has compiled 12 empowering Bible verses to fortify you in the strength that God promises to every believer. Don't miss adding this book to your daily devotions. We'll send you the strength you need when you make a generous one-time donation to Know the Truth. You can also request a copy when you become a Truth Ambassador, signing up to give a monthly donation. And when you become a monthly partner today, we'll also send you a custom Know the Truth mug designed just for our newest Truth Ambassadors. Call us at 888-644-8811 or give online at ktt.org. We're so grateful for your support that makes Know the Truth possible. I'm your host, Wayne Shepherd. Join Philip DeCourcy tomorrow to hear the conclusion of this message. There's more to learn about classic Christianity, Thursday on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Mm-hmm.